Hey, I Hi. made it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thanks a lot for coming on today, Carl. Really, really appreciate it. I know you're a really busy man. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Okay, great. So um, I'm sure the questions will come hard and fast like they did before. So um, I do have a couple of general questions before we get into it. So firstly, where are you based? So my office is in Beverly Hills, so uh, LA, Southern California, and I live in a place called Orange County, which is about an hour away. Nice. So you, are you commuting an hour every day? So I don't work every day. Um, I, I treat patients about one to two days a week. Nice. So yeah, so I make that, uh, that commute about one to two days a week. That's still going to be a long, like, it's, it's probably not that long in distance. No, it's just the it's traffic not. That's like, it's probably only a, a few hundred meters. Yeah, LA traffic is, uh, is pretty crazy, but it's worth it. You know, yeah, right. Well, we found that out the yeah. hard way. We, um, we drove from uh, Beverly Hills to, to Disneyland. We didn't realize it was going to take us six hours. Yeah, so I live, like, close to Disneyland, so yeah. All right. So everyone has to make that trek at least once. Okay, so are you teaching at the moment? So you said that you're working one day, one to two days a week of seeing patients. What are you doing the rest of the time? So I have a tech company that does artificial intelligence. It's called Pearl. Oh, we're getting to that. And uh, yeah, so we can, we can get into that. But that's where I spend a lot of my time in addition okay. to lecturing. All right. So a couple of general questions that everyone wants to know about everybody is, what's your favorite food and what do you like to drink? My favorite food, let me adjust my light here. My favorite food is sushi, for sure. And uh, to drink, I know this is going to be so boring. Everybody's going to hate me for this. Uh, I like to drink water. Um, I don't drink alcohol, something that people uh, don't know about me. I've never drank alcohol and never smoked, never done any kind of drug. So that is, uh, <laughs> that's a weird thing it, about me. It's not weird. Is it sparkling or still? What's your, what's your poison? uh still i would say yeah i'm just right, I'm so you just, just took water it right guy. It's so boring the bottom there, yeah like very not even, not even sparkling All i don't right. know biologic like yeah i mean don't get me wrong you know i love drinking like uh, a nice smoothie or something like that okay so um tell me a little bit about you and your backstory how did how did you know where did your journey start how did what made you want to get into dentistry what made you want to um get to where you are yeah, so my dad's a dentist. Um, I grew up basically as an artist. You know, I was a professional dancer as a kid. I was a musician. I loved to draw. And I was never super good at school. I did okay because I tried hard, not because I'm smart. And, and then, you know, I, I thought I really like medicine. I was always fascinated with medicine. I thought I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And I started looking into things and then I said, oh, dad, you know, I want to be a doctor, but maybe I'll just try dentistry. Like, do you have any friends that I can go, go, you know, uh, observe? And he said, oh, yeah, I've got this friend, Chris Larson, and he's an oral surgeon. So I went and started observing with Chris, started assisting. I became an oral surgery assistant, worked with him for two years. And that just like blew my mind. I loved it. I loved every aspect of it. And I started to see how art could come into it and that's where that's where it really grabbed me because so that yeah, really I think at heart I'm an artist your, I kind of guess it really explains a lot of your DSD type stuff that you do where you that's can right. really see those lines like I think that for me I'm not someone that can really um, get into cosmetic stuff because I just don't see it as well as other people yes. but um, I think that if you've got that art background you're really good at that then that's the way you can really shine with that yeah, you so, know, I had the art background, but then had to learn the science is how it is for me. I had to have to work hard at the science because the art part comes easy for me. Okay. Okay. So when you were doing, when you were treating patients, what was your thing? What was your procedure of choice? What did you love doing more than anything? Still currently, I would say single tooth implants start to finish, um, especially, especially aesthetic zone. That's, okay. that's really the stuff I love, like. Immediate placement, immediate provisionalization, custom impression copings, you know, matching adjacent teeth, especially when you have difficulties with missing papilla or, you know, those type of things. I love okay. those cases. And are you using magnification for your, your work? Yeah. So right now I use sixes, I think. I've gone up. Okay. I started at 2.5. I think I went to four and then I went up to six. So some of my partners use eight. 
uh, on their loops. But yeah, I love magnification. I can't imagine working without it. And a headlight too. I can't imagine working without 100%. a headlight. Uh, 100%. We don't even actually have lights on the ceiling. Uh, we don't have like dentist lights at our <laughs> practice. Dental we only light. have headlights. Yeah, we only have headlights. Awesome. Okay, so um, I do want to kind of take a small uh, digression, I guess, is um, Pearl AI, so your artificial intelligence thing. Tell me, how did you get in? What is it, firstly, for everybody? What, what, is, it, what okay. is it? And how did you get into it? And we'll go from there. Yeah, so Pearl is, we're a computer vision company. And what that means is that we use the ability of a computer to see. Uh -huh. So like uh, Siri or Alexa, that's called natural language processing. That's allowing the computer to listen or hear. But we're allowing the computer to see. So we're analyzing different types of radiographs. So you have periapicals, bite wings, panos, CTs, and then also looking at intraoral scans. So we're seeing things like you know, caries, bone loss, periapical radiolucency, margin discrepancies, et cetera, et cetera. And then analyzing radiographs in real time. Okay, so if I were to submit a bite wing or a PA, how long would it be before I got a result? Oh, milliseconds. It's basically instant. Okay. And how reliable is that? Say, let's say I'm, I'm a dental. And firstly, who is it applicable for? And what instances would you be using that? Why, why would I send my PAs and bite wings, et cetera, in? Yeah, so it's basically a second opinion. And I think it's for many reasons to build trust with the patient. The other thing that we've tested and other, other researchers have tested this too is that we're human and we're not very consistent. So you don't read radiographs in the morning like you do in the afternoon. You don't read it when you're tired or when you have a lot of energy or before lunch or after lunch, or if you have a fight with your wife or you don't have a fight with your wife. We know Who that- fights with their wife? And not me, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, we know that as humans, we have an inconsistency problem. And that's one of the things that AI is very good at is being consistent. Uh, so do you, you know, think it makes it's mistakes a... sometimes too, just like just like a human, but it's very consistent in when it makes a mistake. Okay, so do you think that's a really good tool for someone that's just come out of dental school who might be a little bit um, not confident or not as confident as maybe a um, you know a veteran in the field? So if they want to rather than going and asking the principal dentist and necessarily disturbing them, um, it might be something that they could submit their bite wings and PAs just to get a second opinion rather than, you know, if they don't have the opportunity to do something else. Yeah. So I think this will eventually, and you'll see this being rolled out in 2021 because our, our FDA approval is right around the corner. Um, you'll see this in every, every practice in the world. It's you, every practice in the world will analyze radiographs with AI. This will be just a normal thing that we all do right now where I see the biggest lift is utilizing interdisciplinary dentistry. So, you know, a lot of restorative doctors, they think about restorative and that's all they think about, right? They yeah. miss the calculus ledges on the molars or they miss the implant opportunities or the ortho opportunities, et cetera. And then, you know, uh, turning that back around, you have the specialists as well that are also kind of tunnel vision and they're doing the ortho, but they miss the fact that there's like a small little caries in between, you know, the interproximal of the premolars. So just making everybody have kind of a, a truth between them will really allow everyone to get better care, you know, faster um, and, and build trust with our patients and with our colleagues too. Okay. And how do you see that um, working out with, say, medico legal things? Well, one of the big things that I like to talk about in my light side course and, and in general is limiting doctors' liability because I'm big on that. You know, I've gone through legal issues with some of my patients. Most people have received at least like a threat or something throughout their career. So a big goal of mine with this was to limit that strictly because again, we're human, we're inconsistent and we miss things sometimes. So by having an AI over your shoulder, that's gonna say, hey, I know you're focused on this, but did you see, you know, in this tooth, what's going on here? Make sure you at least write this in your chart, talk to the patient about it, and limit your liability. That's, that was one of my goals of doing this. So really it's helping you flag things that you may or may not have missed. That's right, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And going forward with that, 
does the quality or is there a minimal sort of um, recommendation for the quality of the radiographs that you submit? Yeah, you know, just just with everything, quality does matter. So the better quality you have with the data, the better detections you're going to get. You know, in addition, with AI, we do specific tasks that are kind of over my head that are more an example of what the engineers could answer, where they can enhance radiographs. So if you give it a good radiograph, you're going to get better results. However, right. a poor radiograph, we can enhance to get acceptable, acceptable results. And in doing this for our FDA trials, as you can imagine, we had to use all types of radiographs from you know, all different aspects of the country or the world and different, um, uh, different socioeconomic statuses and different ages just to make sure that it was applicable for any radiograph that's taken. Okay, that's really cool. And I guess that this sort of technology will only get better with time as AI gets better, right, that's quality right. of radiographs get better and things like that. So that's, yeah. really, that's really awesome. So, I mean, I know that's one of your, your um, big projects that you've got going at the moment, but another one of your big projects is dentistry and mental health. So that's something I'd really like to spend a lot of time talking yeah. about, given that some, that's, a, that's something that a lot of people really do not talk about. So yeah. I'm one of know, the only ones. Right. So um, I do want to, uh, just before we do want to jump onto that, is when Pearl becomes available, how will people be able to get on? Do I just jump on the website? Is that how it works? Yeah. So hellopearl.com is the website. We have products that are available right now. We have something called Practice Intelligence, which analyzes all your radiographs and gives you business insights and shows you areas where you may have missed things and opportunities. We have areas that are working currently in the lab space that are automatically marking margins at scale. We're working with insurance companies. So we have a lot that's actually working in market. The part that is requiring the FDA approval is actually just showing the patient, having the oh, patient be okay. involved with it as a medical device. Yeah. But really at the moment, you still can access it as a second cross-check right. for yourself. Okay, yep. that's brilliant. And yep. that's great to know. Um, so going back to the dentistry and mental health, um, I really, like I said, a lot of people are not talking about it. Maybe they're talking a little bit more about it now with the advent of social media and of course your courses, but, um, I want to know what kind of pushed you to start promoting this and, and wanting to shed light on this area. Well, I went through a really dark time in dentistry where I almost quit our profession. You know, it was a time where. You would look at my social media and say, gosh, this guy has it all. You know, I was speaking at the AO and AACD and Seattle Study Club and speaking at all the biggest places. I had a professional practice, you know, I had a great family and I was really just ready to quit. I couldn't handle the stress anymore. And I had to go through some self-discovery to realize what it was that was causing me problems and what aspects of our profession was causing me to have stress. And then once I went through that and I was able to come out of it, I said, you know, I, I am speaking all over the world on all this stuff that kind of doesn't matter. Like, who cares if the margin is better on your crown if you're not in the right mental health space? And I just realized like what was important in life and said, I'm gonna use my platform to help people so that they don't have to go through what I'm going through. So I started speaking, you know, someone would invite me to speak about implants in the aesthetic zone. And I would speak for three hours about implants. And like the last 45 minutes, I'd talk about mental health. And that's what everybody wanted to come talk to me afterwards. They didn't say like, oh, great talking about screw retained crowns and, you know, reducing cement and zero bone loss. And like, no one gave a shit. Everybody was just saying, Thank you for talking about that. I went through a difficult time. My wife's going through a difficult time. My brother, my son, um, you know, no one's talking about this. And it's a big epidemic in our profession. So I just wanted to start helping people and use my platform that I had in the speaking community and, you know, on social media to, to spread that word. Because when I started posting about it, I can't tell you how many messages I would get saying, like, you know, I was suicidal two months ago and I saw something that you posted and it made me feel like I wasn't alone and I wasn't the only person going through this. Thank you so much. And like, I mean, just crazy stuff that I felt like I could really help people that way. 
Well, I do think a lot of people do experience it, some more so than others. But yeah. um, I think that it's very brave of you to come forward and say that because nobody wants to kind of um, say anything about it. Everyone doesn't want to be the person that says anything. Weak. Yeah. Right. They don't. They don't want to be weak. That's exactly yeah. right. I was the um, same way. And I've, I've got a, a couple of really good questions about that. People did post about that. And what is, one of those is, what is it about dentistry that you think? allows this darkness to really creep up um do you feel it's the solitude where a lot of people just work in that one room and they kind of just have their own little thing and they're just doing their own little bit and they might have a bit of chit chat with their nurse or whatever but really majority of the time you're living a pretty you know a lonely lifestyle for majority of your, of your day yeah that or, definitely is one aspect keep going or is they've also put in um, is it the fear of not achieving perfection? Well, it's, it's multifactorial. Um, you know, you have the aspect of working in a silo where you're the highest educated person in your office. You know, oftentimes dentists work alone, like you said. They never interact with other doctors. Now with, you know, not being able to go to congresses, they can't interact with their colleagues. That's one of the aspects. Another aspect is the great fear that many of our patients have. And that fear comes off on us. We being human beings want to empathize with our patients. We try to take their fear off of them and it gets put on us. You know, there's studies that show that as we're giving injections, our blood pressure rises by sometimes 20 points. When we're giving injections, like we're trying to take the pain away from them. And I think that's what? a very no noble thing that many of us don't think about. Uh, you know, the debt... And we have people think of doctors as like these godlike creatures. And guess what? We're human. You know, just like I talked about with AI, we make mistakes. We have good days. We have bad days. We can do 10 surgeries that are exactly the same and two of them fail. And we don't know why. And the other aspect is that it's different in medicine than in dentistry. You know, in medicine, the blame oftentimes doesn't go to the doctor. You know, I, I always give the same example, like you get in a car accident, your, your knee's broken, they try to repair you, you still limp at the end. The, the, the patient usually doesn't say, oh, I'm gonna go sue the doctor now because my right. knee limps, you know? But if the bite limps or the aesthetic limps, or, you know, there's, there's a limping in the mouth, in dentistry, it's immediately like, oh, well, the doctor did something wrong. You know, they always say your crown, the crown that you did is wrong and you need to replace it and you need to do it for free. So complications is a big aspect. You know, I've been trying to do a lot of posts about this for people to understand that we can't be blamed for everything. I call it the triangle of blame. You have the, the doctor down here. We can do certain amount of things, right? Our, our, our technique, our follow-up, our, our, our diagnosis, et cetera. Then you have everything the patient does. So what they're eating, following directions? Are they taking the medications? Are they flossing? Are they brushing? Those are two people we can blame, right? If I do something wrong, if the patient does something wrong. But then we also have that third aspect of the triangle, which is everything we can't control, uncontrollable factors like genetics and musculature and you know all these things that we can control. But in dentistry, so much of that blame just comes back to the dentist. I do see that a lot in the sense that, like you said with medicine, they've come with a problem. But with dentistry, I find that a lot of the patients don't want to own their problems. Yes. Even though they come to you with bad teeth or whatever, they don't want to own it. Yeah. Now, one question that keeps coming up a lot, um, one of them is personalities attracted to dentistry. Do you think that has a propensity to increase the, the darkness that some of these people experience? For sure, yeah. So I have something that I call the pathway, the pathway to depression, which is, a lot of us come into dentistry and we like to control things, right? We're kind of control freaks. I know I, I definitely am. I, I, if I can control something, I would like to. Um, and if you don't come in with that personality, oftentimes we instill that into you in dentistry. Right. And, then you get, and then you get to this aspect where you want to control everything, but you can't. And you have all these uncontrollable factors, which can then lead to lead to that depression and, um, you know, feeling that, that those negative thoughts. I think one of the biggest aspects of why we have 
the mental health epidemic that we do have is because so many of us love our profession. And you may be thinking like, what's bad about that? But what we do wrong is we align our purpose in life with our profession. So, and this was me exactly. I was like Kyle the dentist, you know? Everybody knew me, Kyle the dentist. I would introduce myself, hey, I'm Kyle, I'm a dentist. Like, Ugh. I was so proud, I love our profession. You know, I love uh, margins and, you know, implants and guided surgery and sinus lifts and all this stuff. But what I didn't realize was that when I aligned my profession with my purpose, in a profession that you're destined to fail, meaning like if you do enough implants, they're gonna fail. If you do enough crowns, something's gonna fracture, the patient's gonna have pain or whatever, you're aligning yourself of your self-worth to go down with those complications. And that was exactly me. I was so proud to be a dentist. That my purpose in life was to be the best dentist. But when I had complications, then not only did I have, have guilt, because guilt is more like I've done something wrong, but I had shame. And shame is really like something's wrong with me. And so once I changed my purpose in life to be what it should be, which is like helping others, being a family man, you know, supporting, having great relationships in my life, then it was just like, I love dentistry, but it's my profession. It's not my purpose in life. I I'm, find Kyle, a I'm a people, father. I happen to be a dentist. Right. And this is something that I've really struggled with myself is um, one of my mentors very early on in life said, be present. Right. The, the, you know, when you're being, when you're, when you're in the office, be the dentist, when you're at yeah. home, be the father, be your right. husband, be the wife, be whatever you are. And it is such a hard thing for me to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, I really Me need too. to, you need to have that turn off. So when you leave the office, you've got to turn off. When you're at home, you've got to turn on and you got to, you got to wear different hats all the time. But I find a lot of us, especially if we really love it and also social media. So where, you know, I'm talking to you, you're in, the United, you're in the United States, it's in the evening for you. So you're posting and stuff now and I'm seeing that. So I'm constantly always on and for me right. it's early in the morning. So it's, it's hard to take those hats and swap those hats around. So I think being present is, is a big issue. The other yeah, one I find- It happens because we love our profession so much, you know. Uh, Christian Coachman always says, you get two dentists together, we're gonna talk about dentistry, right? We just love this stuff. And no, we have that. to put it, we have to put dentistry in its place. We have to know that it's our profession. And it seems and, here, and that's be, it. be where your feet are. That's, that's a brilliant line. I yeah, really I like that. that. So another thing I found is, um, and this is something that when I put those questions up, what would you like to ask Carl? I find that this was really a resounding question. One of the probably the biggest one was about social media. And I'm going to kind of take all the questions and, and roll it kind of into one. And that was, has social media become a double-edged sword? In the sense, it can be bad that you see some really exquisite work and you put this in, I mean, you do see some average and, and poor work as well, but majority of the time you see really, really exquisite work if you follow certain people. And that allows you to put a lot of self pressure on you. And, you know, maybe you look at your work and you go, well, like what you were saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as that person. I'll never be as good as that person. I'm, you know, I'm not, instead of working towards your goals and, and helping yourself to achieve that, you kind of, box yourself up and then you get really down about it. So, yeah. but by the same token, also um, it can be good because people can hide, hide behind a handle and reach out to people and ask questions or privately say, you know what? Um, I like what you wrote, like they've done for you. you know, I like what you wrote. You made me feel better and I feel like I'm not alone. So yeah. do you feel that social media has been a little bit of that double-edged sword? And yeah. you know, the, people do get their dopamine hits from social media. So do you feel that that has potential to make this, you know, this black dog a little worse? Yeah, I think that it's changing for the better. So you have definitely social media when it first came out and I go over this in my course is I always say that everybody don't take what they what people post as real life, right? This is their highlight reel. People are showing what they want to be perceived at. And this was the reason why I started um, posting more of my complications. 
because I saw people like Joseph Kahn that constantly posted his complications. And I said, like, he's a true educator. He's not coming out saying, look how good I am. He's coming out and saying, look what I thought I did right. And now look what I realized. And that's when you can really help educate somebody. So, you know, you see so many, I mean, I mean, so many of my friends that are just amazing dentists, I see their stuff and I'm like, I mean, not only is the, you know, restorative work or the surgical work exquisite, but the photography and there's no blood and all their patients are beautiful. And like, this can't be, this can't be real life. And remember that most of this is highlight reel. Now, I think there is a, a turn happening in social media where you get more people that are really being real. You get more people that are, you know, not wearing makeup, that are showing you real life, that are showing when they messed up. And that's when we really come together. And that's when, you know, like social media has been great for me because it's allowed me to spread this positive message of, of mental health and that you're not alone and that it's normal to go through these struggles. And almost more dentists go through this than don't go through it. So depends on how you use it. My, my you know, one line advice would just be know that most people's social media accounts are, are not real life and that is their, um, their highlight reel. Okay, I get that. Um, how important is it to have something outside of dentistry? Because you'll find that a lot of dentists, they go to work all day long and then they come home and they talk dental, 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 dental. And then if, they, if you ask them what's their hobby, they sit there going, yeah. I don't know, I don't have one. Yeah, so there's- What do you there's... like to do outside of dentistry? And they go, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, travel. think about dentistry. Everyone always says yeah. travel, but no one's yeah. doing that now. So right. well, there's... is it to have a hobby? I think it's so important. I see it a lot with my father. My father's a retired dentist and some of his, his friends that are retiring. Dentist was, dentistry was their passion. Dentistry was their hobby. And, um, you know, even sometimes if you said, well, my family is my hobby. Now these people are empty nesters. They don't have anything to do. There's, there's some, uh, some studies that the American Dental Association did. Only 10% of dentists take any time off and I think it's something like under 20% have a hobby, which is no wonder why, you know, we align ourselves with our profession because we don't have anything to do all day. We don't have anything else that we think of. So right. when you get home, you're thinking about tomorrow's case or how can I get better in photography? How can I, you know, do better grafting, whatever it is. And we have to just know that dentistry is our profession and that's all it is. That's all it can be or else we're going to have, we're going to have these problems. Okay. Um, just before we jump onto a slightly same sort of topic, but a little bit different. Um, I see that there's a lot of issues with regard to people have asked questions of, with regard to social media where people. Sorry, way, closing the door. My son just came it's all and cool, opened it. It's all cool. um, when you, you see people that um, are really good at talking full of knowledge here let me find this question here uh, i find there's a lot of people that can talk for days and are experts online but w and you know it, that's easy to do when you can vet your response you can delay responses you can right. think about your responses and everything but when you have that person in, in in person in real life in front of you they can be very very different and, and a bit more of a recluse so essentially because people get into that rut they don't want to go out and socialize even though that's really good for your mental health they're happy just to sit at home and type responses to questions and, and talk via chat because you can really vet your answers. How do you feel that that plays an impact on, on mental health? I think it definitely has a big impact on mental health. You know, um, you saw, you see how it impacted people during the pandemic. You know, we had, I mean, unfortunately, I'm being told all the time when there's doctors that are committing suicide because I'm one of the only people that's talking about suicide. But during the pandemic, I mean, you should have seen how many messages I got. My friend committed suicide. Oh, I heard of a, you know, a pediatric dentist in my city that committed suicide, unfortunately. But we have to be, we have to be happy with ourselves. We have to understand, and I think this comes with having a purpose in life that is outside of our profession. If you have that purpose in life, you know what's important to you, you can, you're accepting of what comes in life. You know, it may not be easy, it may be very difficult, but 
you see this a lot with um, kind of self-proclaimed experts in dentistry, right? You see people that are going out and speaking in front of crowds. They really have to know their stuff because people are asking questions. You have to know the answer. You can't really bullshit, you know, on the spot right there. However, you see a lot of them that kind of hide behind their um, social media accounts. And like you said, they can go and look up the article and then come back and say, oh, well, I had this or that. Right. It definitely, it just isn't, it's not real life. I think social media is great for connecting people. You know, you and I probably would never would have met, but social media through friends. I mean, I have so many friends that I'm very close with that, like, I've met one time, you know, like, right. my, my friend Simon Shard in the UK, like, we talk all the time. I, I tell him he's, like, my best friend in the UK, but we've met one time in person. We've talked a bunch of times, you know, on WhatsApp and on, on social media, but, um, it can bring us together. It just it has to be done in the right way. I think it's, it's like anything a little bit, you know, a little bit at a time, as long as it's not all consuming. I think mm -hmm. that's part of the issue. Now, if I, I know that, like I said before, people kind of feel like they're not good enough or um, they're not as good as others they see or potentially look up to. How much of that is a problem and what's their best way of getting around that? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, what I what I talk to because I speak well, best to a way lot of dealing with it. Yeah, I think it's just understanding what the other person maybe has gone through to get there. Like I have a lot of young doctors that have talked to me and said, "Oh my gosh, you know, you've got this great practice, and you know, you did this surgery or whatever. Like that's so cool. I wish I could do that." And I'm like, "You've been practicing for a year. Give yourself a break. You know, like." It took me a decade to do this. And I learned from learning from people that had been doing it for 30 years. Right. And, you know, my mentors, like my, my friend Sasha Jovanovic, he's, I tell this story all the time, but one time I was going through a hard time and I was talking with him about, I think some complication I had with a patient. And he said, you know, Kyle, I've failed more than you've even tried. And this was something that I look, this was someone that, you know, he's like a God to me in, as a mentor, as a person. And hearing that like brought him down to a human level. That's like, oh yeah, I think he just has been doing great his, this whole time, but he's failed his way to the top. You know, right. that's how that's how so many of us have to do it. It's like you said. I mean, I you know, it might have taken you ten, twelve, fifteen years to become an overnight success. But right. a lot of people haven't seen all the shit that you've had to wade through in order to yeah. get there. I think that's a really valid point. Having right. said that, I do see a lot of grads that are coming out that are, you know, one, two, three, four years out that are wanting to do the most insane stuff. And they just haven't, they're, they're really trying to run, but they haven't spent very much time crawling or walking. And I feel yeah. like that's, that's a slippery slope and there's, there's an opportunity there for you to get yourself in big problem. It so is. You, you have to push, you have to push yourself enough. You have to be outside of your comfort zone enough to keep advancing, but not to get yourself in trouble. Uh, here's a really good question. Um, strategies on managing mental health for dental influencers whose popularity on Instagram will naturally end or no longer be the flavor of the month. Now that is a bitter pill to swallow. Yeah. So you yeah, keep, like, constantly keep your content fresh and you might be the hottest thing right now, but you need to realize that's going to end at some point. And what are you going to do then? Well, that, yeah. that, that's, you might have to go to the court. You might have to go to Carl's course for that one. I think that's, that's more than just a live chat. That's a, that's a long-term one. Yeah. And the course we talk about derms, diet, exercise, relationships, meditation, and sleep and incorporating all these aspects as far as, um, you know, limiting your liability, understanding who you are, understanding what your purpose in life is, that really helps a lot. You know, for me, like social media, if I had to give it up, um, I would like to say I could, uh, you know, it is good for my business, you know, it supports my courses, it helps me get uh, you know, my, my other businesses and, and patients and that kind of thing. But I used to take it so much more. I used to try to portray this beautiful, you know, like what I wanted everyone to think about me. And what I found was that the more real I was, the more like real shit that I showed, the more engagement that I got, the more people said like, oh, you're real. You're not like some, you know, whatever influencer. Um, you're real. And people want to follow real people. I think 
in the beginning of social media, there was this, like, we want to follow all these things that show like cool cars and that show like this dream life. But more and more, I think people want to connect. They really want to connect on a human level. I, I really respect that you say that. And I think that is very, very, very important. Um, what, you know, I, what, what are people going to get, uh, what are people going to get out of your course? The mental health course this is what I, something I really want to know. Yeah. I think one of the main things is a community. You know, I was going through a difficult time and I noticed that when I talked to anybody who wasn't a dentist, I got no, no sympathy. So they would say like, well, Kyle, you're a dentist. You make good money. You drive a nice car. You're well-respected. I mean, you're a doctor for Christ's sake. What could you be worried about? And then I'd go talk to a dentist and, you know, I had my brother and my dad, luckily that I could really open up to. And they would say, I totally get it, Kyle. I had a patient just like that. I had a staff member that gave me such a runaround. Or, you know, I had a patient send me a letter that said that they were going to sue me. And it's like being in the military. I will never know what it's like to be in the military. I'll never know what it's like to be in the trenches, right? But a, uh, you know, my friend that works at a video game company, he doesn't know what it's like to be in the trenches of dentistry. He doesn't know what it's like to have to do, you know, give a, give a block and you can't find where the mandible is and the patient's nervous and, you know, the patient doesn't want to pay and they don't open wide and the tongue is wide and the cheek is wide. And it, it's a very specific profession that we have. So having a community is one of the main aspects of the course. We meet every week, we talk openly, we share stories and it makes you feel accepted. It makes you feel like you're not alone. And that was what I needed at the time. And luckily, I, like I said, I had my family for that, my brother and my dad who are dentists. But many people don't have that. Even their friends that are dentists, they may not feel comfortable talking. You know, I have depression, I have anxiety. There's just this, it's a taboo subject in Western culture, you know, all type of West, Western culture, every culture, really. So the community, I also give tools and tips on how to, reduce anxiety before it happens because a lot of research showing that it's much easier to reduce it than to deal with it at the end. And uh, we go step by step on, on every aspect of this. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a course that probably every dentist should do at some point. And I think it's going yes. to be something that spreads just as much as that AI course, I think, or the AI. I mean, that you've my got. goal is that, it doesn't, you don't have to go into a valley of despair in order to take this course. I want people to take this before they go through the hard time. So my goal is of course, to have this in dental schools and whether it's oh, me or someone else teaching it, that'd be so good. give it to them in dental school or make it part of our continuing education requirements. You know, I, th I still think it's kind of crazy that we have to take all these clinical continuing education requirements and you still have dentists that are committing suicide because of their mental health. You know, this well, should be a yearly or every two years you have to take, you know, one hour, just one hour of mental health, mindfulness, you know, health training. And, you know, someone just said prevention. That's right. You know, we love preventative dentistry, but we should have preventative um, mental, mental health training as well. Amen. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's something that's really, really, again, not spoken about very much, but but just so crucial uh, especially as things are really starting to progress. Now, um, I had a really good question, which is, um, what do you do if you see it in somebody else, but they don't see it necessarily? <laughs> yeah. Right, so you can see what's, what's, you know, unveiling or what's unfolding in somebody else, but you, you know, you can't, how do you broach the subject with them? Or how do you say, hey, listen, do you want to talk? Or are you okay? Or perhaps you should go and do this or you need to speak to someone, what do you do? Yeah, that's a great question. And what I've, I've gotten that question a lot. I would say the first aspect is ask people how they're doing and make sure that they know that you really want to know how they're doing. So be genuine when you ask. The second thing that I would say is use me as a scapegoat, you know, and that was why I wanted to be public with this is say like, Oh yeah, I saw this crazy guy from LA talking about like, mental health and dentistry, like, have you ever had like a hard time with that? You know, use me as, as an example. Like, 
I saw this guy, Kyle, and he went through a really hard time. And he said that there's a bunch of people that are having, having trouble. Like, have you ever had a problem with staff or with, you know, complications or debt? And most of us have been through a hard time and they can sympathize with that. Some aspect of it. So um, I would say use me as a scapegoat. Okay. That's really, really awesome. And thanks for that. That's a great tip. Now, how important is it to, I mean, you, I think you've been on both sides of the coin now. How important is it to stay up late and watch clinical videos, read papers, um, do some sort of online CE or something, as opposed to get out there and speak or interact with people in a non-dental forum or actually just get a decent night's sleep? And how important is sleep as opposed to just getting that extra paper or just getting that extra hour of cramming something? Yeah, well, there's a ton of research about this and the sleep is more important than almost anything. And be both before you have something important to do and after, there's a lot of research on this. So there's a great book called Why We Sleep by a guy named Matthew Walker, one of the the, the biggest brains in, in um, sleep medicine in the world. And, you know, for me, that's why it's one of the five major things that we do in my course with diet, exercise, relationships, meditation, and sleep. You know, that's, that's one of the four modules is just that derms area. And it's so important, but you have to prioritize it. You know, I was one of these people that was like, I'm going to rest when I'm dead. And then I realized like, I was really struggling, you know, I was really struggling. What I didn't realize too, is that like, I had airway issues that I didn't know I had. And, you know, just recently in September, me and my son both got our uh, tongue tie surgery. You know, I wear, uh, I tape my mouth and I wear a head thing that holds my mouth closed so that I'm nasal breathing. I think it's such an important topic, especially for dentists, because like we're one of the only professions that can help people in this, right? right? I mean, we can change the structure of your face to make you breathe better which is just, is just wild. And we're one of the only professions that can do that. So for me, I'd say leave the last paper and get the extra, you know, 20 minutes of sleep. Well, that's the thing. So I think, like you said, this, you know, sleep dentistry and airway is such a big thing. And it's something that a lot of dentists really focus on, yet they don't spend a lot of time sleeping because they're out <laughs> doing whatever, right? Because they love dentistry too. Well, know? that's right. So, but yeah. there's got to be, you know, like that happy balance. Like the work My, life balance. Exactly. My opinion is that the future of dentistry is going to be AI and sleep medicine. And in sleep medicine, it's going to be so much more preventative. So I think like we're going to be orthodontists are going to be doing ortho like from four to seven and preventing teeth from being crowded, preventing those, um, you know, airway collapses, preventing the orthodontic surgery from happening. And also preventing a lot of the restorative aspects because we now know that like grinding at night is probably due to airway issue, not as much stress as we thought. So yeah. I think dentistry will move even more to preventative medicine because of that, that airway involvement and that sleep involvement. And like Chanel said, yawning in the clinic when you're doing a cons is not really <laughs> going to work. So really, I mean, I've if you are, if you, do get that extra half an hour, hour sleep, realistically, your chances are you're going to be clearer, more focused. You're going to give a better consultation. You're not going to yawn during your cons and you probably get, you probably end up doing better dentistry as a result. Yeah. You perform better. You have less complications. The patients will trust you more. You'll have less liability issues. So that is like one of the preventative measures to having better mental health, better mindfulness in the end, because you're preventing a lot of those complications. Hmm, okay, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, now, for you, I, I know it's, it's going to be, I think it's a little bit obvious, but what procedure has changed the way you practice or what thing has changed the way that you've practiced in the last five years? Oh, five years. So you're a little over. I was going to say guided surgery, but I've been doing guided surgery for more than five years. It doesn't matter. Um, okay, so let's say the things that, that's really changed the way you practice and what, and, and what are those key aspects being? If someone's well, going to take something you know away from this chat yeah. today, what are we taking away? Okay. I would say it has nothing to do clinically. And it's about talking with patients about complications before they happen. 
early in my career, I was so scared that the patient wasn't going to do treatment that I wouldn't talk about the complications as much. You know, I would try to be like, oh yeah, implants are great and they always last and I'm doing guided surgery, so it's gonna be even better and you know, I'm the best. And now I almost try to like talk people out of it. But what I realize is that when I'm more open with them about complications, they know that if there's a complication, they have to pay for it again too. Guess what? They trust me more they refer more patients, they're more likely to do more treatment. I think it's because they take you off of this, this like God podium, and they put you on just a human podium. And you're just talking human to human. And when there's a real connection, that's when they're ready to go ahead with treatment. And that's where a lot of my problems and a lot of my darkness in dentistry came from, was that I overpromised and underdelivered, And then I was trying to make excuses and, you know, some of this led to uh, litigation and, and that kind of stuff. So that would be my biggest advice would be be open and honest about complications. Go through informed consent with the patient, you with the patient, not your coordinator, not your nurse, not your assistant, you talking with the patient about that. And you'll end up actually making more money because the patients are going to trust you more, refer more patients. Okay. And what about learning and teaching? How do you know, let's say, you know, like you said that you've got to know your stuff inside out. What, when do you think that someone's ready to start giving back? Because I know a lot of, like I see a lot of young guys coming through and they want to, they just see people like yourself out there talking, doing lecture after lecture, traveling the world, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden they want to get on that bandwagon too. At what point do you think that it's, you know, you're ready to teach, you're ready to, to take that, I don't know, I guess it's, it's a, it's a yeah, huge responsibility. It's a difficult problem. I would say, you know, I got into it really early. I actually started speaking in dental school because I had published an article. So I was just, I was talking about that specific article. And then as soon as I got back, like you said, I mean, it's exactly right. I saw my mentors that were traveling around the world and getting paid well and, you know, everyone respected them and they had books and they had this and that. And I was like, that's what I want. So I started lecturing. I think whenever you can spread some awareness, um, what I did wrong earlier in my speaking career was try to show off. It was try to prove myself and say, look at how good I am. You know, I'm young and I already know what I'm talking about. And looking back, like, oh, I can't, I cringe when I think of all the lectures that I did where I was just trying to show off. It took me going through my dark time in dentistry to realize how I can be a true educator. And that was, you know, showing my complications, giving everybody else credit, you know, instead of like taking things like, this is my idea. No, quoting the person who said this and said, you know, Linkovicious said this, Coachman said this, Manye said this. And then you can be a person that takes everybody's idea and molds it into something that may be easier to digest. That's what I'm doing with my light side course, right? I'm right. sharing my own experience, but I'm also taking experience from psychology and from research. I'm trying to save those people of trying to, you know, read all those articles and go through all, all those hard times and condense it into seven weeks. So it's, it's that's a tough question to answer, but I would say whenever you think like you can add real value without just trying to show off. I think that's, that's a really, really powerful message. Really powerful. Um, so do you think that professional jealousy and things like that also aid to, to darkness? I, I swear you've taken my course. You're like saying like all the modules. We have a module about professional jealousy. I think I'm yeah. going to take this course. It sounds great. <laughs> but Because I, I, I see that as being something that can be almost all-consuming. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I had it. You know, I, I still probably have it on a lower level. You know, I see people like, oh, my God, that's such an amazing thing. I think what I had to go through was being happy for other people succeeding. I was always like, why aren't I at their level? But what I had to do is be like, wow, they got, you know, voted best doctor and whatever, or they're, you know, driving a great car or they're on a nice vacation. Like, that's awesome. I like would, wanted to be stoked for them. But you know, it took me like seven years of being jealous in order to to get to that level. 
but pr professional jealousy is definitely a problem. Yeah. I, I, and that, no, that comes that. with that, with that social media, you know, highlight reel thing. I, I, you know what, I definitely feel that the same as well. Like I, there was a particular couple of dentists that I thought, wow, I, I just, I just want to be like that person. Well, yeah. They've got great, they've got their skills are good. Their surgical, you know, stuff is on point. And I would just, you know, I want to do what they're doing. I want to be like them. And when I let that go, my practice and, and everything just grew tremendously because I, I just think that it was just so consuming for me that I just couldn't see anything else. And it was and I think really the patients, the patients feel that, you know, the patients feel when you're confident in yourself, when you are real with them, they see that and it creates a better business for you that, you know, ultimately gets you to that next level that maybe you want to be at. Right. And I think not putting yourself down because you didn't achieve something or you can't achieve it yet is not something that you need to beat yourself up about. If you, if you want to achieve it, there are steps that you can take but taking it in a, in a way that allows for your mental health to not take such a battering. Yeah, that's right. Right. Um, so you, you've spoken about the future of, of dentistry and, and how things are, you see it progressing. I would really love to see some of that mental health stuff be integrated into practice as well as um, the business of dentistry. I think that's something that also needs yeah. to be implemented, but I guess dentistry would then become a 10 year undergraduate course. <laughs> right. Um, I know that we're starting, we're going to run out of time relatively soon. I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you're one of the busiest humans on the face of the planet. <laughs> but um, I know I usually ask what online education, what education do you recommend? But I think everyone is so online recommend, online education, you know, just done. Everyone's just so over that. They're just, everyone's just waiting for these borders to open so everyone can I just know, jump right? in the first plane and they'll do a course in Uzbekistan just to get out. Yeah. Um, but uh, one last I would point. say, let me, let me answer that real quickly. I would say the Spear Airway course by Jeff Rouse. I think that is going to be a course that like changes people's lives and how they see dentistry. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, and last but not least, how do you want to be remembered? Oh, this is great. So I swear you're asking all these questions that we do. In, we do this in, in Lightside. Uh, we talk about what you want your legacy to be. I don't, I don't want to be remembered as a dentist at all. If, if, you know, if people are like, Kyle was a great dentist, that's a terrible legacy. Like, I don't give a shit about that. And I love dentistry. And I think about my grandfathers, you know, my grandparents, we talk about them, we have all these stories about them. I don't even know what a lot of my grandfathers did for work. What I know is that like, they sat on the ground and played cards with me. And, you know, we went to the beach, we had ice cream, like, so... I would just be one. I would just be one. Um, wanted to be known as being a family man and someone that that tried to help others and make people smile. That's awesome. So someone's asked the name of your course again. It's called Light Side. Uh, it's in my link in bio. You can sign up for the wait list, and we we only open it a few times a year, and the next one's going to be in May. Okay, that's great. So so you're so essentially, if I'm going to get this right. You'll, if you, it doesn't matter how many lectures you've given or how many units of Crown and Bridge or how many implants you've put in or how many lectures or how many chapters in books and everything you've done, if that's the only thing that you're remembered as, then you feel like you've, you've probably failed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, if I'm known as that, for sure failed. Yeah. Yeah, for that's, sure. That's for me, awesome. it's about family. It's about helping people and, you know, building, building other, others up and making them happy. All right. Well, you know what, if there's any final questions, guys, this is the time for it. But otherwise, Kyle, this has been so good. And we've really, you know, we've, we've not discussed one clinical thing. But in <laughs> know, a roundabout right? way, we really have. So, yeah. you know, I really want to thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having this chat with me. And really, again, I can't thank you enough, not only from, from me, but for the countless thousands of other guys Um, for the countless thousands of other guys that have got the confidence to maybe speak up about mental illness or, or things that they're going through. Thank you. Yeah, if I can inspire anybody to be the light in their specific neighborhood or, you know, group or group of colleagues, spread that word. Let's be open about this. Let's support each other in dentistry and, you know, our whole profession will rise. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carl. You've been a champion. Really, thanks. really. Thanks for having me. On. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Be good. Bye. Bye for now.